When the original Xbox launched in 2001, it was written off by many. Too large, too expensive, too clunky, it's just a PC, that god awful Duke controller. But these would not be my thoughts, of course. I fell in love with the machine as soon as I saw it. Microsoft somehow knew exactly what I wanted for my living room and they delivered. But there's a good reason why the form factor was so big and it's all because of this. The original Xbox would come with a built-in hard drive, eight gigabytes to be exact. Now you might have to remember at the time, this was unheard of. The Dreamcast, PlayStation 2 and GameCube did have storage options, but they were limited to memory cards for save games and some small updates. Now of course, this is not entirely accurate as the PlayStation 2 FAT model does have the option to expand the hardware with a hard drive. In fact, in 2004, Square Enix released Final Fantasy XI online for the PS2. It required a broadband adapter and a 40 gig hard drive to play. But the Xbox was the very first console that had a hard drive built in right out of the box. And it was a move that confused many. What could you possibly need with so much space? When you launched into the dashboard, it said there was 50,000 plus blocks of free space as compared to the minuscule amounts you'd normally see on memory cards of that era. But was all that space even required? And what about Peter Moore's famous quote in 2008 when he said, the hard drive in every Xbox killed us? Well, as usual, let's dig in a little and take a close look at what made the Xbox hard drive such an important feature for the console and one that was ultimately adopted by all other hardware makers in future generations. There were two things in our plan that we thought absolutely critical to the success of Xbox and games on Xbox, which had never been done before on a game console. Number one, a hard drive that would be important not only to save information about the player's state and what accomplishments they had done, but also so they could store large amounts of data somewhere and be able to access and change that over time. The Xbox hard drive is a critical part of the hardware infrastructure. The whole goal was to bring a new way to serve up content to gamers, which at the time remained mostly static. Meaning, if you did buy a game back then, you were stuck with that build forever. The game couldn't be updated easily, but with the Xbox, thanks to the built-in hard drive and ethernet port, games could be updated along with the concept of DLC or downloadable content, which would be introduced to expand the life cycle of any game. The original Xbox evolved with the player. In 2001, Xbox still hadn't finished their Xbox Live infrastructure, but once it was ready to release in 2002, it simply required a dashboard update that installed itself over the top of the existing one that came with the retail Xbox that you purchased. This would open up the Xbox Live tab on the dashboard to get you all set up. Now this is an important thing. When you do power up an original Xbox, the system does quite a few things, and one of them is to check if there's a game inserted into the DVD drive to boot from. And if one isn't detected, the Xbox dashboard files are stored on the hard drive and are booted into. Normally dashboards like this are stored in flash and aren't easily updated at all. But the whole goal of the Xbox hard drive was to keep your system up to date. While simplistic by today's standards, the Xbox dashboard did do quite a few things. It handled DVD movie playback, provided that you had the dongle inserted. You could also play CDs. You could adjust various system configuration options, including video, audio, parental controls, date and time. You could also take it online if you had the Xbox Live update, as well as save game management. And of course, we had custom soundtracks. There was about 150 original Xbox titles that supported custom soundtracks. And the way this works is by inserting a music CD into the Xbox DVD drive, it would be possible to rip the entire disc to the Xbox hard drive and replace a game soundtrack with your own custom one. Obviously, this is something that is stuck in the 2000s and simply wouldn't fly in today's world of DMCA. But this was just another value add for the consumer. And Microsoft did carry this forward to the Xbox 360. And of course, the Xbox hard drive was used for save games. This is really where the hard drive was a great investment. You had tons more storage than you knew what to do with, and there was never really a need to buy any additional memory cards for the OG Xbox unless you wanted to transport your profile or save games to another system. At the time, there was no concept of cloud storage, so any type of profile transfer needed a memory card, but otherwise, out of the box, the Xbox did everything. Microsoft would infamously remove the hard drive on the Xbox 360 arcade unit, which received much criticism for, but we'll get to that a little later. So far, we've discussed the benefits of the Xbox hard drive 
from the perspective of the gamer. But the question remains, why was there so much space, at least for the time, for just the dashboard, some DLC, save games and custom soundtracks? Well, the Xbox hard drive wasn't there just for a dashboard, DLC, save games and custom soundtracks. Its purpose was quite versatile and developers could really start to take advantage of the hard drive in some very interesting ways. For developers, having access to a hard drive was a blessing and one of the Xbox's most important features. Each game could take full advantage of it, and developers could rest easy knowing that the hard drive was always available to them and they could rely on its presence. The Xbox hard drive performance metrics were for the time quite impressive. The average seek time on the hard disk would be around 10 milliseconds. That's compared to the 130 milliseconds from the DVD. And just to be clear, seek times in this metric is the time to move from a current read-write position to a new one. The fast hard drive access meant that games that streamed in level and texture data would be possible. When we covered the Emotion Engine on the PlayStation 2, we praised the developers for coming up with new ways to stream in data, to think differently. This was done by processing many tasks in parallel, which also included scheduling DVD reads to bring in new geometry and texture data on the fly. On the original Xbox, its architecture is more PC-like, with a large, at least for its time, 64 megabytes of main memory, the largest of all sixth generation consoles at the time. The problem with the Xbox was that its memory was unified between the CPU and the GPU. This meant that developers had to be very careful when allocating rendering budgets to ensure there was enough memory available for games. And by setting up temporary cache data on the hard drive, meant that compared to the PlayStation 2 streaming technology, the Xbox could solve for it by simply pulling in its data directly from that temporary storage space, speeding up loading and streaming times significantly. Games such as Halo 2 and Fable are excellent examples of Xbox titles that take full advantage of the hard drive. Many believe that Halo 2 would simply not be possible on any other system other than the original Xbox at the time, and it's all thanks to the hard drive. Without it, it's left up to the DVD drive and that's over 10 times slower. Every single original Xbox game has access to four separate data stores on the hard drive. There's user data storage that manages save game and profile data per user, title persistent storage, which would persist data such as high score tables, additional DLC data, and any other data that is considered game-wide. Next is the utility data storage, which is similar to the title persistent storage, but it's temporary. And this is perfect for not only caching data, but also to be used for temporary scratch base to take away seek times away from the DVD. And the very best example of clever use of utility storage that I can think of, it has to be Halo 2. For anyone who played Halo 2 on the OG Xbox, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Boot up your Xbox, skip the Microsoft logo, skip the Bungie logo, get to the main title screen, and press A to resume your campaign. You're literally back in the game in less than 30 seconds from turning on your Xbox, and at the main menu screen, you're in the game in about 15 seconds. The hard drive really does make a huge difference, and this is one of the many reasons why people believe that games such as Halo 2 Fable, Doom 3, and Half-Life 2, which all have heavy hard drive access and reliance on the hard drive, simply would not be possible on any other system other than the original Xbox. Now, of course, that is up to your thoughts and interpretation, and as soon as you throw down the challenge, there is obviously a developer out there that's saying, I can do that, and there's probably a way to solve for that. But I do think that we can all agree that if it wasn't for the Xbox hard drive, a game such as Halo 2 would be a lot more fragmented, with significant loading screens during gameplay rather than the brief pause when you move to the next part of the campaign. Doom 3 had heavy use of the hard drive. Level data was static with loading screens that broke up the gameplay, but Vicarious Visions would develop a texture streaming algorithm with prediction to know what textures needed to be pulled from the hard drive. This was developed during a time where streaming of texture assets wasn't really a common thing. And maybe the most well-known example is of Morrowind. Todd Howard famously said that in order to get around a memory leak, he would make the Xbox reboot itself back into the game. Now we have already covered this story in more detail and I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. But ultimately, what he's talking about is using the hard drive to build a save state of the gameplay and then rebooting the game back in and loading directly back into that save state via a command line switch. This was a Hail Mary to get around a memory leak that could not be found. 
And this is one of the reasons why there are pretty heavy loading screens on Morrowind on the original Xbox. But on the flip side, it's fair to say that no other sixth generation console at the time could support a game like Morrowind. The hard drive was crucial. The homebrew community also innovated when it came to the original Xbox. Once the hardware was opened up for unsigned code access, it turned out to be the perfect device for emulators and ROMs. Because every Xbox has a hard drive, this meant that dashboard replacements could be built and installed either by replacing the Xbox dashboard or it could be just a secondary dashboard that you could load into. And this is why the Xbox was so popular for years and considered one of the very best consoles for emulators. It was powerful enough and it had the storage. And best of all, the community came up with tools to allow for much larger, up to two terabyte drives to be installed. But you didn't even need any of that. You could mod any Xbox and have it running your favorite Nintendo games in no time, no matter what configuration you had. The storage partition would be used for things like save states, skins, and additional ROMs that you needed. But it wouldn't stop here. The community innovated, and just like the commercial developers, homebrew developers also solved problems that were seemingly impossible. And I was personally responsible for one. The original Xbox, as we said, has 64 megabytes of unified memory. This meant that some emulators such as Final Burn Alpha X or Surreal 64 could not load larger ROMs because the system would simply run out of memory. There was no built-in paging or virtual memory management at all. But to work around this, I would build a virtual memory manager for Final Burn Alpha X that could load in the largest Neo Geo ROM and I would then bring this code to other emulators such as Surreal 64. The idea was crude, but it worked, effectively leaving a byte-swapped copy of the ROM on the Xbox Persistent Storage Partition, and for any memory access that threw an exception because it wasn't loaded into main memory, it would simply pull that page from the file system and the execution would continue. Now this is obviously not perfect, there's going to be some slight pauses and hitch during the gameplay, but use of the Xbox Cache API commands could help with this in some way. Virtual memory management did get the job done, and it was used everywhere in the Xbox homebrew scene to work around Xbox memory limitations, and it was all thanks to the hard drive. It simply would not be possible without it. When the Xbox 360 launched in 2005, Microsoft had made the system expandable. The hard drive was now optional and could be easily added or removed. The base model Xbox 360 would not come with a hard drive at all, instead adopting a proprietary memory card that could store saved games. The dashboard was all stored into the system's NAND, and it was all encrypted. Of course, a hard drive could be added at any time, and when they became cheaper, more people would adopt and upgrade to one. But the point here is that Microsoft suddenly had broken their own rules. No longer did everyone have the same hardware configuration. And as such, developers had to rely more on the DVD drive once again, effectively scaling to the lowest common denominator. Have you ever noticed that some games that you install on your Xbox 360's hard drive actually run slower than they do from DVD? Well, let me tell you, it's not you. It's that the DVD in some instances was the optimal way to play games. While many games still use the hard drive for caching data, nothing on the Xbox 360 could quite match the super fast loading speeds of Halo 2, for example. And we have to also consider that the Xbox 360 came with 512 megabytes of RAM, a significant step up from the original Xbox. And this in turn means that much more data could be loaded into the main system memory. So the reliance on the hard drive for temporary cache storage or scratch space wasn't as important as perhaps it was on the original Xbox. Of course, we can't dispute the success of the Xbox 360 and how it turned out to be but it was apparent that the visionaries at Xbox at the time felt like the hard drive was an overpriced mistake. But I disagree. I personally believe that it's one of the most important pillars of what made the Xbox brand so special to many of us. Without it, things simply wouldn't have been the same, and the quality of the games in my opinion that we would see come to the platform would have been diminished. And with that, we are going to leave it here for today's video. Let me know your thoughts and experiences with playing games on the original Xbox in the comments below. As well, if you were a developer that worked on the original Xbox and you did have experience with the hard drive, or maybe you came up with some interesting algorithms to stream in data from the Xbox hard drive, I'd definitely like to hear your stories in the comments below. We're going to leave it here for today's episode, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, please don't forget to leave me a thumbs up. 
and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Bye for now.